Sire, remember the Athenians. This is a quote we're going to tell a story about, about the Persian king leading up to the Battle of Thermopylae. Since we're getting to that, we might as well get all the characters in line here. So who was Xerxes, the Persian king? If you saw the movie 300, you saw him depicted as this kind of despotic villain raving maniac with nose piercings and lip piercings and all that. And of course, that was nothing like the real Xerxes. But um, Xerxes was called king of kings, king of the lands. He was the emperor of the greatest empire that the earth had ever seen. I'm going to read you a list here of the countries. I have to read them because I can't remember all that he ruled over. India, Bactria, Parthia, Arya, Aracosia, Drangiana, Persia, Medea, Babylonia, Assyria, Armenia, Egypt, Libya, on and on. I could go on and on, basically from India all the way to the Mediterranean coast. And how rich was he? Like maybe a hundred years after this, when Alexander the Great sacked the capital at Persepolis and took the gold, the gold, Alexander took the gold in 16,000 pairs of mules. So he was the richest guy in the world. Now, advancing out of Asia when he was coming to Greece, Xerxes and his army, this give you a little sense of the personality of an absolute monarch. They built a bridge of boats across the Hellespont, where the Black Sea flows into the, to the Eastern Mediterranean, and about a mile long across this strait. And a storm came up and sank the boats. So Xerxes was so infuriated by this that he ordered his overseers down to the shore and with their whips, and they whipped the water. They whipped the beach for daring to defy Xerxes. Um, as they advanced, as the army advanced across Thrace towards Greece, um, they would send envoys ahead. The army was supposedly two million men accompanied by a fleet of a thousand ships. They would send envoys ahead to the various cities demanding that they surrender, which of course they all did. And they were assigned the various cities to feed the army for one day. And supposedly the army was so vast that this would bankrupt city after city after city. The army with its men and its horses supposedly drank rivers dry as they were passing along. But uh, there is one sort of interesting story to show you Xerxes' frame of mind. Coming along the coastline of Thrace, they came to a big wide beach and Xerxes kind of had the idea, got it into his head that he wanted to see his whole army all in one place at one time. So he ordered his throne set up on a headland overlooking it, and they had the army kind of pass and review all day long, chariots, you know, wagons, armies, the whole thing. And as he was watching this, this is according to Herodotus, Xerxes began to weep. And one of his, his counselors said to him, you know, sire, why are you so moved by this? And Xerxes said, it just occurred to me, watching these men, this incredible spectacle, that a hundred years from now, not a single man or beast that's here today will still be alive. So short is man's time here on earth. So he was, I want to tell you one other thing about uh, the empire of Persia at the time, that this was a great culture. You know, what is modern day Iran was an was incredibly great culture. And the way it sort of came about, Xerxes' great-grandfather, Cyrus the Great, the Persians lived in the mountains. They lived in a really rough country. And they came down to the plains and defeated the Medes and took over their empire. And that was kind of how they got started. And the, but but um, Cyrus the Great would not move down out of the mountains. He wouldn't go down to where everything was lush and green. And they asked him, why would why didn't he do this? And his famous quote was, Better to live in a rugged land and rule than to cultivate rich plains and be a slave. So how did the grudge come about between the Greeks and the Persians? It turned out, remember I was telling you how vast the Persian Empire was. Greece was this little tiny country far, far, far in the remote edges of the empire. And in fact, the Persian king hadn't even really heard of it. They were so far away. And at some point, the Athenians, in one of their many wars, 
they burned the city of Sardis in what is now modern Turkey. And it was one of the king's cities, one of his tributary cities. And when Xerxes heard about that, he said, who are these Athenians? Who are these crazy guys that would dare burn one of my cities? And so he sort of put it on this memo to his servant. And every night as, as uh, Darius, this was Darius, the grandfather of Xerxes, as he sat down to dine, he had a servant whisper in his ear, sire, remember the Athenians. So what happened was it came about that Darius decided to have his revenge. He sent this army to Greece and the Athenians came down and met him at the shoreline in battle formation. And this was the Battle of Marathon, 10 years before Thermopylae and the Athenians won. They drove the Persians back into the sea. And a kind of an interesting sidebar to this story is the Spartans were supposed to bring their entire army to this fight. But because of a festival to Apollo was sacred, and they were not allowed to bear arms. They came a day late and they missed the whole battle. And all they could do was kind of sightsee around the remains of the battle and congratulate the Athenians. And it was a source of tremendous shame to the Spartans that they had missed this battle. So back to 10 years after that, Darius has died and his son Xerxes is now upon the throne. And he decides, I'm gonna revenge Marathon, I'm gonna revenge Sardis. And this is when he put this entire giant army of two million men and a thousand ships together. So the whole concept, the word now had reached Greece that this incredible army was coming toward them, rolling up city after city after city. And the Greeks put together this, they tried to rally all their forces. And the reason that they fought at Thermopylae was this was strictly a holding action to give the Greek cities time to rally. Thermopylae is a very narrow pass, just like the movie of 300 showed you between mountains and the sea like this. And the concept, the Greek concept was that in this narrow pass, the great numbers of the Persian king's army would be kind of neutralized because they could only get a certain number of people into that narrow pass at a time. And their cavalry, which is their main weapon, would be useless at that point. And their archers, which was their second main weapon, would be more or less neutralized. So they felt like the Greeks felt like if we could send a small force that could just hold this pass for a couple of days, it would give the rest of the Greek armies a chance to rally in the rear. And why did they pick the Spartans to do this? Because the Spartans were universally recognized as the only truly professional army in Greece and that they were the ones who really had been trained from birth to stand and die, to believe that death for their country was the highest honor they could do. So that was the, the concept of this, the Persians coming along from the east with their vast army and their vast fleet, and this small force, 300 Spartans with 4,000 allies from the other Greek cities, they came, beat the Persians to the pass, occupied the pass, and waited for this great army to show up. And this was the, the setting for this incredible battle that was about to come, the Battle of Thermopylae. Thank you.